All right, in this video, we're going to talk about net torque, and you're probably going to hear my really cute son yelling in the background. All right, draw a bizarre apparatus or object. Three masses that are attached to each other by three different lengths of rod. We'll say that the mass of the rods are negligible. And this whole thing will rotate as a rigid body. And to make things fun, let's say that each mass has a force applied to it. Maybe you and three of your friends get together and you decide that you are just going to all hit this thing as hard as you can at different places. Who knows? This kind of will let us see what we mean when we talk about net torque. The idea is simply that each of these forces, F1, F2, F3, at each of these radii, R1, R2, R3, are going to produce their own separate torques, which we can call tau 1, tau 2, and tau 3. Easy. Remember that torque is defined as the component of force that is perpendicular to the radius times the radius. So I could also write this as, can you hear F1 perpendicular times R1 plus F2 perpendicular times R2 plus F3 perpendicular times R3. All right, now let's talk about those forces and what we can replace them with. Force is equal to mass times acceleration, and each of these objects is going to have an acceleration. Um, but I don't know what acceleration they'll have relative to each other. They're all gonna have different linear accelerations because they are not at the same radius from the center, but they will all have the same angular acceleration. And remember that linear acceleration is related to angular acceleration alpha or fishy by multiplying alpha by the radius. So I can rewrite each force equation to be m alpha times r. And when I plug m alpha times r into each of these three force equations, I'm going to need to be careful to make sure that m and r have a subscript. So it would look like this, m1 alpha r1 times r1 plus m2 alpha r2 times r2 plus m3 alpha r3 times r3. Okay, so to go back for a second, remember that the angular acceleration is an angular motion quantity, and all of the angular motion quantities, so theta, omega, and alpha, or the angular position, the angular velocity, and the angular acceleration, all of those things are shared for any object on a rotating body. So like if you and your friend get on a merry-go-round and one of you gets at the center of the merry-go-round and the other goes to the outer edge, you will both have the same number of rotations per minute and then the same angular speed, right? Like revolutions per minute. And if it speeds up, you'll have the same change in how your angular speed changes. So there's no difference in how you're rotating. However, there is a difference in how fast you're going your friend at the center of the merry-go-round is going to be going much slower than whoever is at the edge of the merry-go-round because at the edge of the merry-go-round there is a larger radius and so you're covering more circumference. So angular quantities, they're always uh, conserved for all the different objects that are in a problem or on a rotating body. Okay, um, now let's talk about this nasty equation that we've created. Since alpha is a shared value, we can pull it out. And we will have m1, I'm sorry, I'm going to do this in parentheses, m1 times, I'll say r1 squared, plus m2 times r2 squared, plus m3 times r3 squared, all times alpha. So notice I pulled out the alpha and then I squared all of the r's. Okay, if I added a fourth object, m4, and some radius, r4, and a force, f4, what would change about my equation? Well, you would take everything that we just did and add m4, r4 squared, times alpha. So there's going to be a pattern. And that pattern is you sum the product of mass and radius squared for as many objects as there are. So we'll write I 
for that. That's the common notation for sums. All times alpha. So net torque is equal to the sum of mass and radius squared at all points times the angular acceleration alpha. You'll notice that this looks very similar to our net force equation. Net force equals m times a, where, sorry, I wrote a fish, a, where a is your linear acceleration and m is your mass. Or remember, mass is actually your linear inertia. So what we tend to call this is your rotational or moment of inertia, the summa m r squared. The letter that we use for it is i, so that what you'll get, let me get rid of that real quick, is i times alpha. The net torque is the moment of inertia times alpha, the angular acceleration, and it looks a lot like the mass times linear acceleration. Let's do a brief note to make sure that you're getting this moment of inertia thing. The moment of inertia is the sum of m times r squared for however many pieces of mass there are on a rotating body. If there is like literally three objects attached with rods like what we did, then you would just go through an algebraic process to do this. However, the AP test will also ask you to do this for infinitely many particles, in which case you will be using an infinite sum, summa mr squared. And of course, this would mean that you are going to do calculus, and you would write r squared dm. We're going to do a whole other video on, on that, though, so don't worry about it now. For now, just kind of try to wrap your head around the idea that the moment of inertia is an object's resistance to changing rotational velocity. Resistance to changing rotational velocity. Um, like here, we have three different rotating objects. Notice that there are masses along the rods, and those masses are the same, but they are distributed at different radii. When I release a little tiny bob to rotate this apparatus, you'll notice that the object that has more mass at a farther radius is better at resisting change in its angular velocity. Therefore, it moves more slowly. The object that has most of the mass towards the center of its radius, or closer, you know, smaller radii, it moves a lot faster, and that's because it has less inertia or less ability to resist change in its angular velocity. Now let's take a look at some common moments of inertia. So like I told you on the AP test you're going to be asked to derive moments of inertia so I will go through the moments of inertia that you have to be able to derive with calculus but for the most part you can use these to solve everyday problems and sometimes the AP test will just give you a moment of inertia based on a shape. So here we have solid cylinder or disc. This is basically your average pulley. Um, a hoop about its symmetry axis, the red line represents the line that it rotates around. Um, this is basically like a bike tire. And a solid sphere, that would be like a bowling ball. Whereas a thin spherical shell, that would be like a basketball. And then, of course, a rod, you can take a rod and rotate it about different points. Um, notice that for the rod, it uses L instead of R. That occasionally will uh, come up as a problem, and we'll discuss how to use calculus to do it. Let's see how this works out in just very straightforward practice problems. Your bike tire has a radius of 28 centimeters and a mass of 2.2 kilograms and can be treated as a small hoop. Okay, so right away, I would go ahead and think, all right, small hoop. What is the moment of inertia for a small hoop? Well, if I look up my common moments of inertia, uh, oh, hoop about the symmetry axis, so m r squared. So I'll go ahead and I'll write m r squared. You can use lowercase or capital, it doesn't matter to me. And then off to the side, I'm going to say r is not 28 centimeters, but 19 centimeters, or 0.19 meters. Okay, great. Off to a good start. What constant torque 
is required to bring it up to an angular speed of two revolutions per second in eight seconds. Okay, that tells me that the time it takes is eight seconds. The initial angular velocity, you could say omega i or omega f, I'm gonna use knots for this one. Omega naught is zero. In omega, the final angular velocity is two revolutions per second. Hopefully you've figured out how to quickly convert revolutions per second um, into radians per second. Basically one revolution has two pi radians. So this would be two times two pi rads for every one rev or four pi radians per second for your final angular velocity. Okay, and it wants me to find torque. That should be a clue that I need to find the net torque. And the net torque is equal to I times alpha. We need to think, can we find alpha from the information that's given? And yeah, we can because we know that the change in angular velocity over the change in time is the angular acceleration. So 4 pi radians per second minus 0 over 8 seconds is going to give you pi over 4 radians per second squared. That's a terrible S. And I can use that with the moment of inertia. For the moment of inertia, I would do m times r squared where the mass, oh, I didn't write that down. The mass is 2.2 kilograms. Okay, so I is, I'll just write this here, m r squared times alpha. So 2.2 kilograms times 0.19 meters, the whole thing squared, times pi over four radians per second squared. And all of this will give me Oh, wait, maybe you caught my mistake. 4 over 8 is, two, is 1 half, so it would actually be pi over 2. Whew, sorry, pi over 2. Radians. Um, anyway, when you put all of that in your calculator, you are going to get 0.12 Newton, kilogram times meters per second squared, um, meters of torque. Great job. All right, let's do another one. You want to find the moment of inertia of a precious roll of toilet paper that is 10 centimeters in diameter. So you hang a 50 gram mass on the loose sheet and let it unroll. Using a meter stick and stopwatch, you measure that the mass falls 0.8 meters and took 0.6 seconds to reach the ground. All right, so let me take a second to draw this. Okay, so here we have this toilet paper roll that's going to unroll as this mass falls down. Some change in height of, we're gonna call that negative 0.8, or we'll just write 0.8 meters, and why don't we decide that down is the positive direction for this problem. Now anything that points down will be a, a positive um, equation, or you know, factor in our equation. Okay, so this thing rolls down and it takes 0.6 seconds to get there. You might think to find the moment of inertia, I just need to look up the shape of the toilet paper, which it looks kind of like a solid uniform disk, so maybe you could use that with its common moment of inertia. Um, but actually, instead, what you would want to do is think about how net torque, sigma tau, equals I times alpha. So if you can take the net torque and divide it by the angular acceleration, that will give you the moment of inertia I. And that's what we need to do for this problem. Now, it turns out that finding the net torque is a little bit difficult because if I was to think about the net torque on this toilet paper roll, there's only one force that's unrolling the toilet paper roll. And that's gonna be applied into radius R, which let's write that down real quick. 10 centimeters, so five, centimeters is the radius or 0.05 meters okay so at this point at this radius there is going to be tension which we will call T if this 
was moving with a constant velocity, if this mass was falling with a constant velocity, then that would mean that T is equal to the weight of the object. Because remember, there's going to be a tension force, T, acting up on the weight, and the weight, Mg, acting down. If those things were balanced, then you could just say that the tension causing a torque here is equal to Mg. But instead, it's speeding up, so that changes things. Instead, we have to kind of wrap our minds around two things. One, the net torque on the toilet paper roll, sigma tau, is just T times R, the tension times R. And the net force on the little tiny weight right here is going to be T minus, oh, actually, let's do this, Mg minus T. And again, we're going we're gonna to do it that way because we decided that down is positive to simplify things for our problem. Okay, well, for the net force, I know that it's equal to m times a, mg minus t, and therefore t is equal to mg minus ma. Okay, boom. So I've got that figured out. I know that the net torque is mg minus ma times r. All right, that would mean to find my i, my moment of inertia, I'm going to rewrite this with i on the left, I equals sigma tau over alpha. This would mean that on top I have mg minus ma times r. And now on the bottom, I'm going to have something for the angular acceleration. Well, let's think about this for a second. The angular acceleration, alpha, can be related to the linear acceleration, a. Um, we usually write it like this, a equals alpha times r. Uh, so if I wanted to find alpha, I would take the linear acceleration and divide it by the radius. So I can put that down here, a over r. Of course, a fraction and a fraction, it hurts. It's just, it's awful. So what I'm going to do is that r is going to come up here. And now I have m, g, a, and r. In my equation. I know what m is. m is 50 grams, so 0 0.05 kilograms. I know what r is. Can I find a, the linear acceleration? Well, it turns out you can, because you know that t is 0.6 seconds. It's dropped from rest, so that would mean your initial velocity is 0. And the change of height or the change of distance, we can call that delta y or delta x, is 0.8 meters, which means you can use this equation. We'll write it with y's. 1 half a t squared plus b naught t. The initial velocity is 0, so that whole term disappears. And if you want to find the uh, acceleration, you just multiply both sides by 2, and then divide by t squared. Now I have a way to find the acceleration. I could <laughs> plug that into both things and really mess up the equation, but let's just get a number. 2 times 0.8 over 0.6 seconds squared, make that acceleration bigger, gives you 4.444 ever, 4.4 repeating meters per second squared. So that's the acceleration. With that acceleration, I can find my moment of inertia by just plugging it in right here. I can say that the moment of inertia is equal to, um, you know what, why don't we factor, we could do a lot of simplifying here, but why don't we factor out the m, m times g minus a, or r squared all over a, and that's going to give me 0 0.05 kilograms times, we'll use 10, 10 meters per second squared minus 4.4 repeating times r squared is 0 0.05 divide that whole thing by oops sorry 4.4 repeating meters per second squared so put this awful quantity in your calculator and you will get a unreasonably small number 1 
0.57, we'll say 1.6, uh, but times 10 to the negative fourth. And the units for the moment of inertia are uh, kilograms times meters squared, which would be kg m squared, which explains why that number is so small, because a roll of toilet paper, um, well, it is not normally measured in kilograms or meters. Congratulations, you have finished this very long video. I'm so proud of you. Good job.